And here all the way from the UK uh, is Kim Burton, who's going to des describe the study they did in the UK, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have Jennifer Christian, who's the president and chief medical officer of Webility Incorporated. I probably didn't say that right, but it's a hard word. Uh, and then we're going to have discussion, and then after that, we're going to have Robert Drake, who's a professor of psychiatry and community and family medicine uh, at Dartmouth, and then Marcia Nettis, who is the vice president and general Man manager of America Works in Baltimore, uh, Brian McDonald, who's program policy and development manager at the World Institute on Disability, and Kim Hutchinson, who's the president and CEO of Disability Funders Network, and after that, we'll have another brief discussion. So, Kim Burton, thank you so much for coming uh, and uh, participating in this conference. Thank you very much. Morning, people. Uh, it's, it's afternoon for me, of course. <laughs> um, I'm a freelance occupational health uh, scientist. I do work with the local university, well, local to me at least, but I also work for or with the Department for Work and Pensions in the UK. And what I'd like to do, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do it, is, is just tell you a story, really, a story about the journey we've been on in the UK. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not it maps onto, onto what you experience over here. Um, I am going to do what Jason asked, which is to talk about this study, which is in the title. But the, there's one or two other things that I want to, want to add in. I think it's important that we accept that work is socially really important. It's what defines us. In the pub, the second thing you ask somebody is, what do you do? <laughs> but what's important is what work does to us. And I'm just going to, first of all, just flash up this paradox. It's been hinted at earlier on. The blue line, oh, sorry, I'm keep, I wander around a bit. Sorry, Jason, thank you. <laughs> I wander around countries as well. <laughs> okay, the blue line is the increasing disability that we've all been seeing right across the developed world. The green line along the top is the prevalence rates for illness and injury, pretty much unchanged. Red line is enhanced health care. It's, it's improved over time. The yellow line, improved workplaces, reduced work risks. Somewhere we've either got it very wrong or we've missed a trick. So the rationale for the UK government action was obviously that disability costs are unsustainable and stopping benefits payments is just unacceptable to society. So the alternative is obviously to help people back into work. But there's a political question, or at least there was in the UK, and it's an important one. Is that acceptable? Is it actually good for people? And the UK government wanted a scientific answer for that question. And what they did to get that answer was to send my colleague Gordon Waddle and I into a darkened room for a few months and <laughs> study the world's literature and answer what is a really simple question, is work actually good for your health and well-being? Does it have is there a sci is there scientific evidence that it has a beneficial effect on people? Simple question. Actually, it was quite difficult to answer. Because the evidence is located across a whole load of different literatures, from medical to actuarial. And what we needed to do was make some sort of sense of that literature and impose some sort of order on it. And we chose to do that by means of a best evidence synthesis, which is essentially a means of summarizing the available literature drawing conclusions based on the balance of the evidence, the quantity of the evidence, and the quality of the evidence, and also its consistency. So we looked at something over 400 articles, and we extracted the data from them and tabulated those data. This was important because this report had to be totally transparent. The source of all the evidence had to be available to whoever wanted to find it. So then we synthesized evidence statements from those data, and then we linked the supporting evidence to each of those evidence statements, and then we rated the strength of the evidence supporting the statements. So for instance, for unemployment there, we give it a three-star rating, which is strong evidence. The strong positive associations between unemployment and increased rates of overall mortality 
mortality from cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and suicide. And then underneath, you see all the references. So that was the sort of format that we used. All I've got time to do today is give you some of the headline evidence statements. And if you're interested, the report is available from either of those two uh, URLs, and full references, as I say, are given right throughout the report. Now, I'm not sure I can read them from here, so I'm going to be rude and turn my head. And the reason I'm doing that is because the wording is important. If we think about the category for unemployment, the relationship between unemployment and health, well, I can perhaps just about make it. So strong evidence that there's poorer general health, somatic complaints, long-standing illness, and limiting long-standing illness. There's also strong evidence that unemployment is associated with poorer mental health and psychological well-being, more psychological distress, minor psychological and psychiatric morbidity, and suicide. There's moderate evidence that unemployment leads to higher medical consultation, medical consumption, and hospital admission rates. And furthermore, and it's possibly quite important to some of you, there's, a str there's strong evidence that the unemployment can cause, contribute, or aggravate most of these adverse health outcomes. There is a connection. It's more than just a simple association. Flip side, what happens if we re-employ people? Strong evidence that re-employment of unemployed adults improves various measures of general health and well-being, such as self-esteem, self-rated self health, uh, self-satisfaction, uh, self uh, physical health, and financial concerns. There's strong evidence that re-employment of unemployed adults improves psychological distress and minor psychiatric morbidity. And there's strong evidence also, though, that the beneficial effects of re-employment depend mainly on the accuracy uh, sorry, on the security. See, I can't see at all. It's my eyes going. The security of the new job and also on the individual's motivation, desires and satisfaction. What about coming off social security benefits and re-entering work? Strong evidence again, improvements in health and well-being from coming off benefits are associated with re-entering work, not simply as a result of leaving the benefits system. Moderate evidence, uh, moving off benefits and re-entering work is generally associated with improved psychological health and quality of life. Another strong evidence, though, that if after leaving benefits, claimants go into poorly paid or low quality jobs, increase, there's an increased risk of future periods of unemployment or sickness, absence, and return to benefits. So, what about work for sick and disabled people in general. Direct evidence is somewhat limited. We looked at a number of different articles and came up with the following conclusion that based on consensus, uh, based on extensive uh, clinical experience and on the principles of fairness and social justice, there is broad consensus across multiple disciplines, disability groups, employers, unions, insurers, and all political parties, the UK at least, that most sick and disabled people, when possible, should remain at work or return to work as soon as possible. And that's sort of across the board, but we've heard earlier on that actually a lot of disability claimants have common health problems. So what about work for them? Well, again, it's, it's a consensus situation. Work is generally therapeutic. It helps to promote recovery in most instances, particularly musculoskeletal problems. Leads to better health outcomes and it reduces the risk of chronic disability, long-term incapacity. And it helps to reduce poverty and social exclusion, obviously. Improves the quality of life and well-being. But of course, some sort of temporary accommodation may be needed to achieve an early return to work. So our basic conclusions. Work is generally good for physical and mental health and well-being. And that seems to be true for healthy people of working age for many disabled people, for most people with common health problems, and for social security recipients. <coughs> Pause for the provisos. We know there are social gradients in health. 
And what we learned was that the beneficial effects of work depend on the nature and security of work. It's acceptable jobs that are good for people or good for health. But overall, the effect of employment status on health is generally greater than the effect of health on employment status. So where did that leave the UK in terms of policy implications? You know, for social policy, it enabled government to say work is the best form of welfare, however they termed it, that's the underlying message they wanted to get, get across. We should be supporting people into work, and we should be providing, I've got good jobs there because that's a term we use, but it may not translate across to all environments. And we also found that we need to get the employer and the public engaged in this process. So now I'm going to move on and think about some of the things, I've got a few minutes, I think, think about some of the things that we've tried in the UK and where we've got to. Uh, government introduced a rather nice initiative called Pathways to Work. This is a sort of a biopsychosocial approach, which kicked in at about six months out of work, which is when our incapacity benefit comes into play. And it introduced uh, the idea of a case manager and a condition management program, and it was designed to help people to understand and manage their condition. It was a shift to a social rather than a healthcare intervention. And it was quite a promising program. The results looked really exciting, apart from the fact that we couldn't afford to do it. <laughs> so government thought, okay, let's go back to the starting block and do some more research and find out what we need to do. So they sent Gordon Waddle and myself, this time accompanied by Nick Kendall, back into a darkened room for a few months and told to work out an answer to the question, what works for whom and when in terms of vocational rehabilitation? It was another best evidence synthesis of a large amount of data. What we did was we defined uh, vocational rehabilitation as whatever helps someone with a health problem to stay at, return to, and remain in work. It's not a, just a healthcare intervention. The answer to the question, though, is that VR, is that VR can be effective and it can have cost benefits, but only if it's introduced sooner rather than later. It's basically this message of action before benefits. It needs to be an integrated approach where healthcare is delivered with a work focus and that the workplace involve, is involved with accommodation. It's a cultural shift really to this idea of recovering, uh, about working whilst recovering. So this idea of working whilst recovering then led to the idea of changing certification in the UK, moved, a move to the fit note and the fit note uh, is a change from certifying people as unfit for work to saying that they can work if they get some help at the workplace. And general practitioners are now using the fit note to, to help to communicate with the workplace to achieve an early return to work. And it's got a positive public health message. The idea that two, two things really, one, work is therapeutic, secondly, the employer is a helper. So. Bring you up to date, where next? Well, Carol Black and David Frost did a report on sickness absence in the UK, which they delivered in 2010. And they concluded that the system is broken, no surprises there, and basically they were saying we're too slow to get the right support to people. And they recommended, among other things, uh, early access to occupational health advice. The government responded positively. 2013, they took their time. It was a bit of a problem for them because it meant they had to spend money. Anyway, they decided to fund this independent service, which will kick off in 2014. And the new service is going to be much earlier referral at four weeks of sickness absence. It will involve case managers and it will involve a step care intervention, giving just what's needed when it's needed to try and keep costs reasonable. And it's going to be based around overcoming obstacles, obstacles to work, obstacles to work participation, obstacles to the expected return to work, because, going back to the idea that most people on benefits, certainly in the UK, have got common health problems, we should be expecting them to return to work if they're given the right help and opportunities. And that may require us to look at obstacles around the person themselves, obstacles in the workplace, and obstacles in the overall context that we're, we're in. The goal is absolutely to reduce the flow onto benefits. 
It's been a pleasure. Thank you for letting me talk to you. Okay, Jennifer Christian. Thank you. I have slides. Okay, hi everybody. I'm here to talk about how to create or avert needless work disability. And uh, notice the word needless and notice the word work disability, if you would. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been the development of some new models, actually. Dr. Burton is part of the development of this new biopsychosocial model of sickness and disability. And uh, I have been involved in the development as well as many others on uh, trying to bring uh, new scientific evidence on how to create or avert, how to avert needless work disability uh, to bring that to, to life in the real world. So I want to start though with the fact that we have actually a gap in our social fabric uh, through which people fall and we end up with needless work disability which is not working, uh, job loss and withdrawal from the workforce. And the fundamental cause of it is that neither healthcare providers nor employers think they're really responsible for helping somebody stay at return to work. On the doctor's side, they think that stay at work and return to work is like not really a medical issue. It's not part of the practice of medicine. It's an administrivia issue. And on the employer's side, they think it's not their business either because they think it is a medical issue. And so we're, it's like we're all playing volleyball and the ball's coming down between us. Uh, so I do want to make sure we're on the same page here. When we talk about the word disability, um, I wish we didn't have that word right now because we really have two different ideas when we talk about it. In the disability rights and in federal disability legislation, we're really talking about impairment and its impact on people's ability to do stuff. And in the workers' compensation and commercial disability insurance industry, when we say the word disability, we mean work disability, that the person is not working. We're actually referring to a period of time of whether the person is actually employed or working. And just to kind of get us on the same page, um, the impact of v impairments varies quite a lot. Most people with impairments are in fact working full time. So there isn't anything about having an impairment that means you can't work necessarily. And different kinds of conditions have different impacts. There are some that are temporary like sprains, wounds, surgery, or the flu. You're at a level of function, you're down for a little while and then you're gonna bounce back up. There are other people who are at a particular level of function and then something happens and they have a fixed loss, they become blind, they have an amputation, they be, uh, develop paraplegia, intellect, or they are actually born with intellectual disability or malformations or have a stroke. Those people were functioning at a particular level and then they experienced a change. Or in case of people with congenital issues, they are unable to develop the way most people are. Then there's the new problem in America, chronic illness. 40% of us now have chronic illnesses, and they tend to be that over time, you tend to get worse. So you either steadily go downhill, or you're going down, and then you have a uh, get better, and then you go down again. They're unstable, and they change life over a period of time. This is the kind of stuff for which we are the least prepared, because most of our systems either assumed fixed loss, or catastrophic loss, or temporary problems. And then we have the new issue really now that the baby boomers are in charge. We, we've noticed that we age. And we have a loss of function due to natural aging processes and degeneration. By the way, 100% of us age, degenerate, and die. So it is weird for us to now be calling being old, fat, and out of shape a disability. So as you're listening to me, I, want, I think we, I would really like to talk mostly about the people on the right-hand side of this screen, because I think this is where there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of preventable, needless work disability happening. Now, on the classic disability side, there is a lot of preventable work disability, too. And actually, Mr. whatever your name is from Kansas, Mike, my new best friend, <laughs> I want to meet you afterwards, is Mike is an example that you can have a classic disability and work full time, right? But over here on the right side, these are people who started out looking like common health problems. Dr. Burton talked about that. These are people who have basically backache, they're kind of depressed, they have a little wrist pain, and somehow it turns into a lifetime of disability on SSDI. Most people with these conditions bounce back and keep working, but some small number don't. 
So they start out looking like they have an everyday thing. And for some reason, their recovery stalls, nothing seems to work. And over time, if you're a doctor and you're looking at these people, you say, wow, this person is a lot sicker than I can find any, any evidence of disease to support it. Other people with this same amount of disease are functioning OK. So these people who have all this subjective illness get desperate, and they start searching around for expensive and unfortunately destructive medical treatments. For example, people with common back pain who end up finding some willing doctor who's willing to do a spinal fusion, and now they're worse off than they ever began, were before, and now they're addicted to opioids, right? So these are the train wrecks that we think of in medicine. And people are going downhill steadily over time, and they end up on SSDI. This is the group where we have a huge opportunity to avert needless work disability. Now, this is the Jennifer Christian recipe for work disability. I like to cook, as you can tell. Uh, so there, it, the, in order to have legitimate work disability, you have to have a medical condition that affects function. Because if you have work disability and are expecting to get paid for it, and you have no medical condition that affects function, then we got fraud, right? But it's not the medical condition that's creating the work disability. It's necessary but not sufficient. What's creating it is the loss of the ability or willingness to cope with that and or a lack of external support. And this is if we want to reduce needless work disability, we need to pay a lot more attention to items two and three on the list. So let's just look at Sad Sam and Lucky Lou. Sad Sam had a bad back. He had a disc uh, herniation. He had surgery. Guess what? So did Lucky Lou. Both of them actually were kind of mediocre employees all along. But Sad Sam worked for a supervisor who said, ah, they'll handle it, meaning the benefits people. And he had a weak supervisor who enabled him to be teased by his coworkers. They would see him at the, uh, they would uh, talk, gossip about him, about how he was loading beer in the back of the car uh, and not able to come to work. He went to see a disabling doctor, got the message, stay home until you're able to do your job. And he ended up on permanent disability. Lucky Lou, same biology, same poor work history, had a different supervisor who said, hey, Hey, let's, uh, uh, let's stay in touch. I, we need you back here at the, at the shop. Yeah, and that supervisor was good and uh, made sure that he got support from his coworkers. He went to see a function-oriented doctor. He was offered transitional work and adaptive equipment, and he came back to work in six weeks. So to every audience that I speak to, mostly treating physicians, case managers, claims adjusters, and employers, and return to work coordinators, I say, do you see this? Do you see identical biology and really different outcomes? Do you? Okay, so what we got to look at is are we creating a healing environment and one that promotes function or are we not? So how to prevent needless work disability is first of all we want to increase recovery of functions that are affected by the medical condition by improving access and reducing delays in care and increasing the effectiveness of treatment. There are probably a lot of people on SSDI today who are getting what I would call weird medical care. And we need to pay more specific attention to function. But secondly, beyond that, we need to restore or strengthen this person's motivation and their ability to willingness to cope. We need to acknowledge that motivation and willingness is part of the formula and wonder why is it low, what can we do to increase it. And also we need to arrange workplace and logistical support to enable stay at work, return to work, or what uh, Kim would say, remain at work. Now oftentimes, the parties in the situation do not know how to do these things. This is the part that is all these economic models aren't working with. People don't necessarily come with the equipment to make the best technical and, and, or the wisest decisions. So if we're going to try and prevent needless work disability, we probably ought to be focusing on people who are dealing with change. Because when they have, if they've been working, and this is, I'm, I, I am focused pretty hard on the working population. There's some of you who are focused more on kids. Once they're over 65 and on retirement, other people can worry about that. I'm focused on working age. If they've been working full time, but they now have developed a new medical condition, they're thinking about, who am I? What's my future look like? They're, if they've had existing medical conditions that are bothering them more, they're wondering, what does the future look like? And if they have a, a new lost capability due to aging, they're wondering, what does this mean? So their minds are flexible right now. I don't think it makes too much sense to spend our effort on people who are stable. They haven't been working recently or they're working age, but they've already been on SSDI for a long time, but they've never worked, they haven't worked for several years, or they're content with their lot. It's not a wise use of public money to put a lot of investment on people who aren't going to be open to something else. 
So when people have one of these changes, they're just natural, we're human beings, we have a change in our life. When we wonder to ourselves, well, I wonder how long I'm gonna be laid up. Turns out that's kind of a southernism that means out of commission. How long am I gonna be out of commission? How long do I have to take it easy? What can I still do? What shouldn't I do? What should I be doing to get myself better? When is life gonna be back to normal, if ever? What does this whole thing happening mean about me? What does it mean about my future? How should I handle this old mess? Don't these seem like kind of the normal questions a person would have when there's been a change in their life because of a health condition? Well, here's the weird part. There's nothing about the standard medical visit where the person gets those questions answered. Where do people go to get these questions answered? Or are we kind of leaving it up to them to make their best possible guess? Now, time is of the essence. We've, uh, other speakers have been talking about this. This happens to be a slide from a non-published population of workers' compensation employees from a big corporation. And the far right-hand side of this slide is the one that turned me into a disability. Somehow I can't make it slide on here. This is the number here that turned me into a disability managing doctor. Because I said, oh my god, I haven't been paying attention to the elapsed time that the longer people are away from work, the chances of them ever coming back to work are dropping. But as the years have gone on, what I've started to pay way more attention to is the first three months on this curve. The, the um, time, away, away from, time away from work is on the bottom, and the likelihood of ever going back to work is on the left-hand side. And so by the time three months of work absence has occurred, and this is after an injury, not a chronic illness, after an injury, so you have a time certain on the day it started, the likelihood of that person ever going back to work is dropped by half. What uh, several disability insurance medical directors told me that they think that for a person with chronic illness who has been trying to cope and trying to cope and has left work, that period of time may be as fast as two weeks because the person's already decided they can't do it, right? So your opportunity to influence how they see their situation is very time limited. Now, there's some reality checks we ought to talk about, which is that the in affected individual has the most power to determine the eventual outcome of a potential work disability situation because he or she decides how much effort to make to get well and resume normal life roles to get out of the sick life state. And by tradition and under the law, individuals have a lot of discretion regarding whether to go to work or not if they say that a medical condition is the reason. You get to decide when you have a cold or you have a little bit of diarrhea whether you're going to make the effort to go to work or not, right? We all have that right. But so we can say that a practical measure of someone's commitment to something is the amount of inconvenience or discomfort they're willing to put up with it, put up with for it. Some people are willing to die because they're so committed for something. For example, police, fire, and uh, soldiers. Other people stay home because they've got a hangnail. <coughs> now, the employer, when there is one, plays a powerful role in determining the outcome because they design or have an influence on the environment in which the injured or ill or aging person is making their decisions. <coughs> the employer decides whether to manage the employee's situation actively or passively, supportively or hostily. And they decide whether to allow on-the-job recovery or make permanent adjustments to the job. They basically control the availability of that job. And doctors and other clinicians have a powerful influence on the situation because they provide factual information and advice, this is the key word here, and advice that will either encourage and support or discourage and obstruct efforts at stay at work or return to work. But they're actually designated guessers. The doctors, we have agreed, this is who we are. In the College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, you guys have turned us into designated guessers. We've been put in the middle. Uh, we, because we've been pressed into service by the system because, uh, you know, people want objective corroboration. They basically don't trust the person to tell the truth. There's the moral hazard of access to benefits, vested interests, et cetera. And also, you think that doctors know everything, uh, and we don't. So we're neither trained in these matters because we actually don't think of them as medical. They're not part of the definition of the practice of medicine. And also, we're not paid for dealing with them. We, it's, it's not viewed as part of what we take professional pride in, in general, outside my specialty. Uh, so it's generally not medical stuff. Now, we acknowledge, though, that we probably are the best available choice. It's probably better to ask a doctor than a second shift supervisor or a taxi driver because we do have some understanding of biology and we see how people are. 
But we should beware of this transubstantiation where you take the wild guess of a doctor and turn it into a fact. Other parties do influence which way the swing groups go. There are people who, when they have an injury or an illness, have a good shot of going back to work or staying there as long as they're noticed or cared about, valued, respected, supported, monitored, and corralled. And there is another group that is likely to go south and have a bad outcome if they're ignored, disrespected, abandoned, alienated, unmonitored, and their no limits are set. So in my view, at least, our country has at this point little or no work disability prevention or mitigation program yet outside the private sector. Social Security, the largest disability insurance carrier in the world, in my view, has a fiduciary duty to the taxpayers to employ some widely accepted techniques to protect its policyholders, which are the taxpayers. So if you, uh, I did talk to some people about this, and they've never even heard the phrase loss prevention or mitigation programs. In the private sector, this is like everywhere if you're a financial entity. And you start trying to think, first of all, anticipatory management. You think ahead to specific likely causes of losses, adverse events, resulting costs, and you take action. And you have kind of two programs. One is loss prevention, where you're trying to take proactive measures to avoid the events entirely, and you keep improving. Now, in our case, in disability, there are other people who are doing the health prevention part. We're doing trying to prevent people ever needing to leave work. And then there's loss mitigation, developing protocols and training in advance so that you're ready to leap into action as soon as events do occur to minimize losses. So in secondary prevention, we want to keep little things little. And in tertiary prevention, we want to minimize the damage. Occupational medicine, my specialty, is a preventive medicine specialty. So what we need to do is move upstream before job loss. All these programs are opportunities to prevent work disability. The employer's time and attendance policies, mandatory benefits, FMLA and ADA, workers' compensation, whether it's just medical-only claims or time-off claims, health care insurance benefits, and then on the voluntary benefits, which are not mandated, again, employers have sick leave, short and long-term disability, and stay-at-work and return-to-work programs. If somebody is working for a small employer, so they're not covered by FMLA, they're not covered by ADA, they are, and there are no voluntary benefits, that person has no upstream place to get those work disability prevention <coughs> services. So if we want to stop creeping catastrophes, we have to acknowledge that the problem has appeared in the medical domain, but the solution lies elsewhere, that the illness is greater than the disease in most of these cases. We need to strengthen these people and get them whole enough so they can recover and cope. And we want and look for timely intervention with integrated, multidimensional approaches to care that will address the root causes, improve the outcomes, and control costs. And just these are two slides. You can see them later. These are both slides on the beneficial effect both on reduced health care demand and increased wages from people that p participated in the Kansas uh, Working Healthy Program. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. So now we have uh, plenty of time for audience comments, questions, whatever you want to say right here. Wait, please wait till the microphone gets there. Tell us your name. Uh, Richard Pierce, I had a question for Dr. Christian. Uh, uh, what would you think of a system where the doctor who is involved in, in this process of assisting someone is chosen in most cases by a lawyer who is paid only if the person is determined to be so disabled that they can't work? Would that be, you think, a good way of choosing doctors <laughs> to treat people in this situation? I'll just say that I have come to realize that money is a consolation prize because you didn't get what you wanted out of life. <laughs> Think of it. Money is often a consolation prize because you didn't get what you want out of life. And the lawyers have come, that's the business the lawyers are in, is giving you the consolation prize. Unfortunately, too many claim administrators at Social Security and VA have the same perception. I see need, let me solve this with money. But actually getting those disability benefits is not solving the problem of this person not having a future and not having a life that's fulfilling and satisfying. I think you guys set that up. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions or comments? Uh, what was the... Um, was the UK's effort at trying to get the physicians to understand the link between 
uh, health and work. Uh, was that successful? And if it was, I'll ask that. And then if not, uh, what would you recommend? Okay. Yeah. It, something I, it's a short presentation. It's something I sort of glossed over. <clears throat> when the fit note was introduced, there was an initiative to try and change the way general practitioners thought about the relationship between health and work. The idea was that if they got the message, they could pass that message on to, onto their patients. Well, <laughs> doctors aren't easy creatures to treat, or to, to teach, <laughs> should I say. They're not easy to treat either, they're not easy to teach. What happened was, th th there was a series uh, around the country of, of, of seminars that doctors were invited to go to, and they, note, invited to go to. Uh, and w it turned out that only the ones who had uh, some grey cells actually came to the meetings, and lo and behold, they went away with the messages, which was fine, because there was a theory that gradually the message would meander its way through the rest of the people within the individual practices and the such like. Of course, that hasn't entirely happened, but surveys have shown that by and large, general practitioners do appreciate the beneficial relationship between work and health. Where they have problems, and it's, it's sort of coming back to your, the, the, the difficulties bit, where they have problems is trying to sort out their role as a patient advocate with somebody who's trying to play with the system. And it's, it's, it's this sort of tension that you're talking about in a way with the lawyers. There are, and these are just basically obstacles to, to the system. So the fit note is an absolutely brilliant idea, or at least I think it is. Is it working terribly well yet? No, the answer is it's not. Is it getting better? Very slowly. Will it get better? Possibly not very quickly, unless we completely change the culture of work and health across the whole population. As it transpires that the best people to change doctors' behavior are their patients. They will listen to them and they will do what they ask. So we're now into a program which is gradually developing of shifting the culture across the population in, in terms of work and health. And, and that's sort of where we are. And whether these new programs are going to work, well, you're going to have to bring me back in a couple of years' time and I'll tell you. Sorry, Jennifer, do you want to say something? Uh, yes, I've actually been very interested in following what's been going on internationally, and uh, I, I think the part of the reason why the UK came up with this idea of the central community-based centers is they wanted to get people with actual expertise at the stay-at-work and return-to-work process to serve as a resource for everybody in the system, for, for employers, for uh, patients, for uh, benefit payers who saw that a situation looked like a better outcome would be possible, but they needed help. Uh, resolving the problems because the stay at work and return to work process can be very complex with all sorts of things getting in the way. Um, a, a very promising program is now rolling out across the country of New Zealand where what they decided to do was since the primary doctors do not really know what to do when there's a problem, that's when they feel squeezed, is their patients putting pressure on them, they've actually put uh, helper people right in the primary care centers. And uh, the, generally speaking, they've been occupational therapists because occupational therapists are aware that the head bone is connected to other bones of the body. They're improvisers and they are very practical. And this has been working so well in New Zealand that they now are actually expanding that program elsewhere. And one of the more dramatic ideas that I think we're kind of percolating is to start thinking that here in the US, we should start thinking that maybe stay at work and return to work services should be part of benefit packages. Because for every working age person who develops a medical condition, that question may arise. And right now, we have kind of a funny little lack of access to services, practical services, to help solve those problems. All the way in the back. Thank you. I wonder if any of you could talk a little bit more about the issues of self-motivation and expectations of people who are dis disabled uh, if, if the condition is fairly subjective and rather moderate. I think that's an important lesson we should learn from welfare reform in 1996, number one, because I think there are many crossover issues. 
And, and I'm just curious, I've heard it quoted, I don't know from who, but for every person who's on disability with one, con one particular condition, you can find six others that have the same or similar condition who are working. So what is the role of the individual in all of this? Both of you. We dance together as well, you know. <laughs> I'd like to see that. No, you do not. <laughs> she can do it, I can't. <laughs> right. The role of the individual, it's, it's a huge issue, isn't it? It's to do with this idea of resilience, and some people are more resilient than others, it would seem. But I, I wondered for a long time as to what it might be that drives that, and one of the things that we've been exploring in UK is, is the idea of people's beliefs and attitudes. If you believe that work is harmful for you, or that you believe your problem is in some way permanently limiting, you're just not going to make that sort of effort because you're afraid. It's to do with what Jennifer was saying about uncertainty. If we're uncertain about what's happened to us, about what we should do, about what the future holds, we're going to spiral down. So I think that the, that the secret to that, it's back to changing the culture and, and education. We need to be helping people to understand their role in maintaining the work participation role and why that's particularly good for them. Tough nut to crack, but it's possible. I don't know. Um, I just want to remind us all that social change is hard and slow. And those who think we're going to fix it all with one law tomorrow, you know, like go someplace else and do something else. Um, but there is actually quite a lot of evidence now that cognitive behavioral rethinking, helping people re-see their situation from a different perspective, can actually change their motivation level and what they do. Um, and actually, the early accelerated benefits project at Social Security got pretty good bang out of exactly that. There's a program called the Progressive Goal Attainment Program, referred to as PGAP, um, that consists of 10 sessions with a trained person in which the person, the, the affected individual, gradually regains their confidence that they can function. They learn that what they've been scared of is unnecessary to be scared about. They start rebuilding a life. And uh, it's very strongly evidence-based. The question is, how do you get these things to people? There's a lot of challenge right now in trying to take all the research that's been done the last several years on how to improve outcomes. There's quite a lot of it. And, and get it actually implemented in the world. So when uh, Kim was talking, or who was it? Mm, somebody here was talking about the need for, oh, Bob Steger, evidence-based practices and medicine. This is what we really, I think if the language somehow could be changed so that the person who is the affected individual has an obligation to be receiving care that is evidence-based and outcome-oriented and aimed at restoring function, otherwise they are not meeting your standards, then that would be a tremendous, a tremendous move forward. All right, one more question. Are you getting ready to ask a question? Okay, we're continuing our pattern here, all the way up in front. <coughs> wait, to, wait till she, she get in. <clears throat> Thank you for having your Kansas graph in there, by the way. <laughs> I have the same one. <laughs> um, but one of the other things, apart from focusing on the individual themselves and their motivation to return to work. In the work that you've done, where are those other spheres of influence that can help someone tip one way or the other, or have you looked at that at all? Well, actually, it's it, a multi-stakeholder thing is ideal, but the three most powerful people are the employer, the person, and the doctor, because they are all, those are the key players at the center, but um, a case manager, a union, a legislator, a lawyer, uh, you know, anybody can actually have an influence on the situation. But you're really, I think the, what we haven't really worked out is, and if you talk to anybody, if you've got a person that wants to go back to work, an employer who wants them, and a payer who's trying to make that happen, it's hard to stop people, right? But when you have any one of those three legs kind of weak, that's where, I think, where we have trouble right now. It's very hard to push a wet noodle up a hill. Right? So if the person has become a wet noodle, that's where we really have trouble. Now I want to suggest, for those of you who are wondering about the power of how you see yourself and what's possible, to Google the words Arthur Borman. Has anybody seen the video of Arthur Borman? 
Okay, he, he was a disabled paratrooper. Obviously, he was being cared for by the VA. And when he starts in this video, he weighs 285 pounds. He's got Canadian crutches. He's got braces on both knees. And he starts by saying, they told me I would never walk unassisted again. Too many parachute jumps. And what, what must have happened, I haven't heard Arthur say, but he had some little thing in his heart where he said, basically, I'm gonna give up on these medical people. Something better must be possible. And so he reached out for help and he happened to hit some macho yoga instructor. It's, it's amazing, actually. It's the yoga, yoga for macho people. And uh, then there, what the rest of the video is, is documentary footage shot by Arthur's son as he transforms himself. Now, what I wanna do with that video is I wanna take it to those doctors at the VA, because I bet you he had a list of diagnoses this long, and he had a list of medications this long, and the doctors have been saying to him, yeah, all the cartilage has gone out of your knees, it's just bone on bone. And Arthur, boy, you got all this degenerative disease in your spine. They were creating his picture of himself, right? Something in his heart, I don't know what it is, made him say, I want a better future than this. And he found somebody who helped him build another future. And it, by the way, it was not a medical person. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Just to, to return to your question just for a second. The workplace, what we found in the UK is that the workplace is hugely important. And, and Jennifer's already alluded to this. If the workplace isn't on board with some sort of accommodation and help, nothing's going to happen. And we're beginning to do something about that in UK. We're developing uh, a toolkit for, uh, for workplaces to use to help people with common health problems return to work. Just as the doctor doesn't understand work, the workplace doesn't understand what it sees as medicine. And until we get all the players on side, that's really, it's, nothing's going to happen. It seems to be crucial. The other group that seem to be important from some of the research my colleagues are doing at Huddersfield is significant others. People in the family with negative attitudes and beliefs can absolutely hold everything down. And how we can change that, well, uh, we're looking at it, but it's back to education, I think. All right, good, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna move into the final phase of the program. What? Yeah, let's keep, keep yeah. Okay. All right. So you tried to overrule me a second time, didn't work. Uh, all right, so Robert Drake is first, then Marsha Nettis, uh, Brian McDonald, and Kim Hutchinson. Thank you so much. So thank you for having me. I'm a clinician and uh, clinical researcher, and I'm going to present uh, look at this problem from a different perspective from what you've been hearing uh, so far this morning. I want to talk specifically about a group of people with a severe and persistent mental illness. Uh, these are people with schizophrenia, with severe bipolar uh, disorder, with recurrent or psychotic depression, and they usually get left out of these discussions, but I believe if you look at the data, some 35 percent of people on SSDI have serious mental illnesses and an even larger percentage than that of people who are on SSI have serious and persistent uh, mental illnesses. So it's a population we need to consider strongly if we're going to do something about this problem. I'm going to make just four points. Uh, the first is that people with a serious mental illness want to work. The second is that we now have a technology to get them back to work. We have uh, many clinical trials showing that we can get two-thirds or more of these folks back to competitive employment. The third is that when these folks are working, like the rest of us in, in uh, the general society, um, they feel uh, enhancements in self-esteem, quality of life, their ability to manage their own illnesses is increased, and they decrease their involvement in the mental health system, which can save a huge amount of uh, money. Now, there are two huge barriers uh, to doing this. One is uh, that people um, risk losing their health insurance, as we talked about earlier, if they go to back to work. And the second is a profound lack of services in the U.S. 
So people with severe and persistent mental illness. Uh, this is a slide from the institutional era when I began uh, studying uh, this population over 40 years ago. The average time of first uh, hospitalization was 40 years, just 1950. So if you developed a serious mental illness, you went into the hospital, you were pretty much there for the rest of your life. The average time for hospitalization in many states nowadays is, is about seven days. So it's just been a huge, huge shift with deinstitutionalization, and the great, great, great majority of folks with uh, mental illness spend uh, almost all of their lives living in the community. While they've been in the community, it's become very uh, apparent that they want to work. And the whole recovery movement in the mental health field is built around the idea that work is central to the recovery process for most people. Now, most people with schizophrenia are not going to become uh, MacArthur uh, Genius Award winners uh, like Ellen Sachs, who's a law school professor at Southern Cal. But the great majority of them want to work and can work. Let me just briefly give you a more typical example. A young people, a young guy came in to see me uh, a year ago. He's a young fellow with schizophrenia. Uh, finished high school, wasn't able to do college, has never worked a day in his life. Uh, he's paranoid. He doesn't like to be around people. He's bothered by uh, voices all of the time, and he thinks he has no work skills. Uh, our vocational counselor talks to him for a half an hour and says, well, you know, this guy's got lots of skills. He has been taking care of his dog for years. Let's get him a job working with animals. And so our team uh, says, you know, one person says, well, I know a veterinarian, I know a farmer, I know uh, somebody in the pet store. It takes us about a week to get this guy a job. He uh, starts out working on the weekend, uh, taking care of dogs that are being housed in the lo local uh, veterinarian's uh, office. Um, he gradually expands his time because he's doing a great job and they love him at the vet's office. By the end of a year, he's working full-time there, he's made friends, and he's uh, not gone on disability. So that's a person that, um, you know, we've saved uh, some 40 or 50 years of disability uh, payments. Over the last uh, 20 years, we have um, progressively developed the uh, model of uh, individual placement and support or supported employment. Um, it's a model that's very commonsensical. It's totally different from sheltered employment. Sheltered employment means that, um, you know, you're putting people in day hospitals, in day centers, in sheltered workshops, in training shops, um, in uh, set-aside jobs, and on and on and on. There's a huge culture and industry of these um, train and place sheltered kinds of uh, workshops for people with mental illness, despite absolutely no evidence that they help people and lots of evidence that they harm people. In all of the clinical trials, supported employment does three times as well as, uh, uh, as these other uh, interventions because they're actually placebos. Um, supported employment means that you ask somebody what they want to do, you place, you find them a job as rapidly as possible, usually very part-time in that job, and then you provide them whatever supports they need in order to um, succeed in that job. So you start with the participants' pre preferences. Uh, it's a team-based approach, so it's the clinical team plus an employment specialist. The supports get set up in a very individualized way for the uh, individual. Uh, there are now 17 randomized controlled trials around the world looking at supported employment for people with serious uh, mental illness. Every one of them shows a huge advantage over the other um, approaches. Uh, one of these trials, by the way, was uh, conducted by the Social Security Administration uh, recently and included only people who were on SSDI. Two of these trials are focused on young people um, who are experiencing a first episode of psychosis, but you can see across all of the trials, and especially one, the ones that have been conducted in the U.S., that we get about 65% of the people back to work. 
The average amount that they work across all the trials is amazingly similar. It's about 25 hours a week. That may be because they're parking below SGA, but lots and lots of uh, um, people tell me that it just works best for them to work uh, 25 hours a week because they have this other job, which is taking care of a serious mental illness. They do need to keep their doctor's appointments. They do need to rest and take their medications and so on. So I'm not sure if lots of them, uh, given health insurance and given a different disability benefits system, would um, get off of Social Security. But we do know that when they're working, um, they feel much better, they do much better, they control their illness much better, they don't go to emergency rooms and, and hospitals. We did one study where we looked at people who are high utilizers in the mental health system, and those who became employed over 10 years, we followed them for 10 years, all expenditures, um, saved the healthcare system $150,000 each. So that's a $5,000 uh, intervention that saved $150,000. We've also followed people over time who are in these sheltered kinds of uh, jobs. Uh, they don't um, accrue any of these other benefits and they don't change their healthcare behaviors. So there really is something about a normal life and being in uh, competitive employment. We have uh, now, we're running a learning collaborative across the country in 14 states, including Kansas. Mike and I have been partners on doing this for the last 10 years. It's funded by uh, Johnson & Johnson Philanthropy, and it's, a, uh, I think, a great example of uh, private and public because it involves Voc Rehab and Department of Mental Health in these states and university, and uh, that, that program puts about 5,000 people a year with psychiatric disabilities uh, back to work. Three other countries have adopted the model and are implementing it uh, across their countries now. But there are these huge barriers, okay? We've already talked about the fact that uh, people with uh, um, psychiatric illness usually get their health insurance through SSI or SSDI, and if that changes with ACA, that'll be a huge, huge uh, change uh, for our people. But the other enormous barrier is that um, support employment's not available in many places. Only 1% of Medicaid beneficiaries have access to a service uh, that would help them. And that's because there's a complete misalignment between what CMS and other federal organizations pay for and what patients want and what what they need. As the director of mental health of one large state told me, yes, I'd like to provide supported employment uh, for everybody in our state, but I'm forced to pour hundreds of millions of dollars in the toilet every year because that's what federal programs pay for. I hope we can change that. Thank you. Thank you. Marshall. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Marcia Nettis, and I am the Vice President and General Manager of America Works of Maryland. America Works, um, we are actually part of a network of companies uh, underneath the America Works umbrella. America Works has been in existence since 1984 and uh, has specialized in placing over 300 thousand people into hard to serve, pardon me, 300,000 um, people into um, employment. America Works has been approved as an employment EN site since 2008. Uh, we have been working primarily with the ticket to work holders to get them back into employment. We very much follow what's called in our philosophy of work, work first theory, which we believe that work is the central or the core essence of a person's growth. So we, we believe in specialize in providing them full-time employment so that they can gain self-sufficiency. The individuals that come through our program come in on a voluntary basis. And um, 
America Works has been working with a number of populations for as long as the, its exceptions in 1984. We specialized in working with primarily the TANF population, individuals who are um, re-entering the workforce, uh, ex-offenders, children aging out of foster care. All of our contracts are paid for performance contracts, which means that we do not receive compensation unless the person has worked for at least for just a little further from me. Thanks so much. Um, we do not receive compensation until the person has worked for at least um, whatever the job milestone would be. For Ticket to Work, they have various milestones. Once again, I told you we take on a work first approach, meaning that when the person comes in to see us, our goal is very simple. Our goal is for an individual to first identify what the assessment, through an assessment, help them understand what some of their challenges might be, and then look at their, uh, their skill level and connect them to opportunities that would be able to help them, once again, start their process into employment. We, because we specialize or more, more so are more interested in retention services, we provide enough wraparound services that once the person is employed, we can ensure that they are uh, receiving the support they need in order to stay in their own jobs. We, we conducted a study um, a few years ago because we were looking at the Ticket to Work um, holders that were coming through our program to kind of get an idea as to what, whether or not we we're best serving this population. We looked at it in regards to um, the total numbers of, injury, of inquiries that we've received, and of those inquiries, we would invite them in to come through an orientation class, and at that time, uh, explain to them what we provide and what we can do to assist them. We have 35 of the individuals that came through our program, 35% of them did not return after orientation. Of that group, the ones who did return, 80% of them were, um, went out on interviews because we believe in a rapid attachment to work philosophy. Of the 80%, if you look on your right side, you'll see that the desired uh, starting salaries, most of the people coming through, they, would, they wanted salaries that did not exceed 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, pardon me. <laughs> I got your sign. <laughs> Loud and clear. <laughs> that did not re uh, exceed $10 an hour, um, which is most of the jobs that we support them, we want them to, to have livable wages. There's a couple of problems, and I'll wrap this up, a couple of problems we see with Ticket to Work. Our main problem is that individuals who are ticket holders, only 3% of them actually take advantage of this opportunity to get into a work program. There are no work mandates. Unlike the town of population that we work with, uh, we were very instrumental in the bill for welfare reform. Um, un unlike that population, they are coming in on a voluntary basis. And when they come in, their goal is to only look for part-time work with the understanding or the concern that they do not want their benefits interfered. We make just uh, certain recommendations for the committee. We would suggest that there would be a mandate review into all Ticket to Work applicants. And in addition to that, we suggest highly that there would be minim, minimum attendance requirements for those going through the program. We believe that if a person has an opportunity to be mandated to attend a program, there will be a higher chance or a higher probability of success, ultimately um, being able to move the person forward. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Brian McDonald. Well, thank you all for staying this far. And <clears throat> uh, I'm happy to report that many of the slides I'm going to present on have already been presented on, so there is more consensus in this room than we might think. 
But I do want to acknowledge all the people with disabilities in this room, seen and unseen, hidden disabilities and otherwise, that have spent a career trying to solve the policy puzzles that we're all about here in this room because there are several of us here. The first person singular or the best form of disability advocacy is your career. As you can tell, I'm not 18, and I'm speaking here about SSI youth. So this is a graduate student in UC Berkeley who is managing his disability, and I think he sets the goal of what I'm trying to talk about today um, eloquently. A couple of my opening slides are about uh, material that has already been covered, and that is um, expectations that the default is that people will look for work and seek work. One of the recommendations following up from Mike Donnelly is allowing VR to begin working with SSI youth at age 16. We should be encouraging, and again to Dorcas, uh, what's the low-hanging low fruit out there that we could be grasping now in terms of incentivizing or improving the, the outcomes? Encourage more SSI youth to use the PASS plan to build careers. Encouraging more SSI youth to develop individual development accounts that are exempt from SSI eligibility once you're on. Individual development accounts and or savings in general are that rainy day fund for, our, for people when they get laid off and have relapses and so forth. There are online tools in almost 10 states, that's 20% of US states, they're actually in nine states right now, that are free and available to SSI youth to assess for the youth, for the family, what is the impact of my benefits if I take that job at uh, Walmart as a part-timer in high school. Well, these tools are a proof of concept. They've been up and running in almost 10 states. About five more states are talking about them and looking how to build them into their service delivery system. At the moment, the federal system is not that receptive to supporting what is going on in the states in this arena. And as we have heard over and over again, so much of the service delivery in this problem area is managed by the state. Finally, We'd like uh, an increased support from Capitol Hill, from the federal government, in internship, school and work experience, and peer mentorship programs. These are proven concepts over and over again that can incentivize more youth to um, get into the game of employment when their non-disabled peers do the same thing. We have data, the longer the youth waits to get into the workforce, the weaker the career outcome. We have so much data <clears throat> we just don't have a lot of action. So the one thing, or the, to pick up on what David Wittenberg said, and I'm trying to keep to my six minutes of fame here, um, what, are, what can we test at the state level that might be an alternative to what we're calling the most egregious process that Social Security puts an 18-year-old or above through? And that would be prove you're in, unable to work and we'll give you a cash benefit. Well, we looked up the word egregious, and it means shockingly bad. So this process is the wrong process at the wrong time for the wrong person. And as Mike pointed out, it is a process in conflict with Voc Rehab, with Voc Rehab's definition of services. The SSI applicant is eligible for services at Voc Rehab automatically. And yet the definition of Voc Rehab is, if you use our services, we want you to get employed. Well, we just got the family through a process that said, we'll give you benefits if you don't work. It doesn't work at the family level, certainly not at the youth level. So testing to get evidence of what we do not know, testing a new way of accessing benefits at the state level within three to four states is what we are proposing in a concept paper that we've been working on for a year with the National Council on Independent Living. We want to be bold, we want to be balanced, uh, to quote someone who works very hard on the Hill on these issues. The option we're talking about is not random sample demonstrations, but three to four, maybe it's five, test sites that have state boundaries and realign the resources that are coming from the federal government into a package of supports for this following set of gatekeeping and these essential elements to what our test proposal or our test pilots would offer. You would get into this program because you meet or equal the listings of impairments and you were low income, but there would be no test for that 18-year-old or above that the medical impairment has anything to do with work incapacity. 
So we would pull the work in capacity test out of the social security definition for this pilot project, we can call it the Let Me Work project, we can call it whatever you like. But it is for a low income youth, low income family, so we can means test it, we can control who gets in. But they get in because they have evidence of a medical, mental or physical or both impairment that would be expected to last a year, on and on. We don't change that. We could include functioning that doesn't necessarily have to do with working capacity, but it could be functioning that has to do with I have serious impairments that that uh, inhibit functioning in life, as Jennifer likes to say. The second uh, major element is that a person in this plan would be required to develop and follow what we call the Individual's Career Plan, the ICP. So if you get into this version of SSI, you are in a plan. You develop a plan, and you would use the traditional uh, means of voc rehab and other resources, mental health services, supported employment, to develop that plan and you would have 12 years of access to this program as Congress looks through uh, reports every three years of how this program would in fact change the dynamics of employment for this very young group. Life coaching would be a um, built-in services service to the pilot, and I see the ax coming. I tried. Uh, life coaching is benefits planning on steroids. So life coaching would be a little bit larger than the benefits planning menu you traditionally hear about and it would offer information on all the kinds of resources that might be available that support that ICP. Thank you. My hook? Yeah. That was the most important slide, so I got that far. Thank you. Kim Hutchinson. Hello. Um, I'm Kim Hutchinson, and I'm the president of Disability Funders Network. And I'm sure that a lot of you are not familiar with the work that we do. We actually work with over 1,100 philanthropic funders across the United States and about 400 not-for-profits, NGOs, state and federal um, leaders and offices to promote inclusive funding. And when I say to promote inclusive funding, I mean to promote it and to secure inclusive funding. So. What's very interesting is that when we talk about what we've been talking about today is state and federal money, but the field of philanthropy last year spent $307 billion on providing programs and services throughout the United States. And out of that, employment was the second most funded program and projects out of that $307 billion. So it stands to reason that as we're talking about building um, new programs to employ people with disabilities in this country that we should also be looking at alternative resources or collaborative resources in the case of Johnson & Johnson to um, fund these programs. Um, as you all are aware, one of the reasons why this is of such great interest to philanthropy is because people with disabilities in this country are at the highest level of poverty, the, the highest level of unemployment. And in fact, the Kessler Foundation did a survey last year with NOD, and they looked at the gap between people with disabilities and people without disabilities and their quality of life. And people with disabilities said by far they feel like since the ADA, there has been little to no improvement in 11 of the 13 quality of life indicators that they were asked. And in fact, in employment, only 17% of people with disabilities had full or part-time jobs versus 68% of people without disabilities. And as we've heard all day today, if you have a job, you have much higher quality of life. In this country, it leads to your ability to have a home, to have greater health, to be able to have a car, to have social networks, on and on and on. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the survey, that, the survey that Kim did is in direct correlation to a survey that the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation did here in the United States. And the indicators that were looked at directly align with the results that they found in the UK. That in fact, if you have a job, not only do your, your quality of life indicators go up, but they also found that you have the opportunity, that, that you have a strong possibility of living six plus years longer than you do if you don't have a job. So, and, and when they're talking about a job through the Robert Woods Johnson um, survey, they were talking about an equitable job with equitable pay. They weren't talking about somebody that has three jobs in order to make ends meet. So, you know, when we talk about in philanthropy building these smart, healthy communities, we have to look at all indicators and all people that live in these communities. And we have to understand that people with disabilities are a large portion of that population. 
In 2010, my organization was approached by two um, states here in, in this country to help provide private funding to support state services where they were losing revenues for health and human services. We now are working with 11 states on helping to fund education programs within public school systems as well as employment programs, health and human services, voc rehab, and bringing private collaborations with the philanthropic community to the table to match the money that the states used to get and or need because the populations have increased. So I would just want to encourage you that as you are looking at um, employment of people with disabilities and, and the, the quality of life indicators and, and the issues that they face, I encourage you to look at um, alternative resources and partners that are out there because when you have $307 billion being spent and over $100 billion of that is being spent on employment from the private sector, they should be at the table when you're doing your research and when you're having your conversations um, regarding your studies. Thank you. Thank you. So join me in giving a hand to all the members of this panel. Thank you very much. Jason. In our, in our last advertised uh, panel, we have a uh, short debate between Rebecca Vallis uh, of the um, Philadelphia Community Legal Services, and we did have David Autor, as, who was a, um, uh, featured on the National Public Radio story that all of us have either listened to or, or read. He, his plane was struck by lightning. He's okay, uh, but we have with us instead, um, somebody who was also uh, extensively consulted on the NPR story because of our time limit, uh, which is uh, Rich Burkhauser, who you've already heard today. He's agreed to step in and, and, uh, and, and comment. Because of our time limitations and the fact that Rebecca has a, an appointment at one o'clock, we're going to do one minute of each, and then we'll have a question, a minute, and the last question, a minute, six total minutes. Okay, Rebecca, come on up. Let me ask you first for your opinion in one minute of the uh, veracity and advisability of the story uh, as, as, uh, as uh, broadcast. Is that a whole minute? You get two more minutes. Get an entire minute. Okay, I better spend it well. Um, so, you know, I think um, a lot of recent media reports, and NPR is one of them, have really generated a lot of buzz. Um, and I think, you know, today is no exception. There have been a lot of really interesting debates, really rich debates happening that have really presented multiple perspectives. I think one of the things that was really disappointing about the NPR series is that it didn't really involve more than one perspective. And I think it's great that it featured um, some people that we've heard from today, and I think that's a perspective we need to hear from. But it really, it left out um, the perspective of the chief actuary of Social Security um, and the trustees reports, which I would say that's a pretty valid perspective as well, given that it was a series about Social Security. Um, so I think that's one of the, the concerns that a lot of people have, is that it was really just one perspective that was aired on a lot of aspects of what it discussed. And and I think the other point I would just like to make in my first minute um, is that with all due respect to um, esteemed economics professors and, and journalists, including NPR, um, listening to many of them into the NPR series, you'd be left with the impression that you really just sign up for disability benefits. Where do I sign up? Um, and I can tell you that's not how it works. Um, and with respect to those folks, I think it's been said well in a, an article in the LA Times, that's a little more of a view from the faculty lounge, which my college professor parents would probably not like to hear me say. Um, but the reality is most people are denied, which we've heard a little bit of today, um, and that the people who are approved have really severe impairments, and that many people with really severe impairments are denied, and they can get denied at the initial level, and they can get denied at subsequent levels, and if they get significantly worse while they're waiting for their hearing, they might actually stand a chance of being approved um, 
And I think that that's a really significant point that was also missing from the NPR series is the level of, of significance of the disabilities. And that's why if you, if you work with people who have these impairments and who receive benefits like I do, it comes as no surprise to you that one in five male and one in six female disability beneficiaries dies within the first five years of getting benefits. Well, I look forward to my second minute. So I, I was um, asked by uh, the NPR reporter um, to give her some insights into uh, DI and SSI, which I did, and uh, more or less said what I said to you. And she told me to stop doing the numbers. I want to do this with people. And I think what we got from her was a personification of some of the issues, the serious issues that need to be talked about with regard to DI and SSI. So it was very provocative, there's no question about that. It was a point of view, uh, but I would say that I've been interviewed many times by the New York Times on all sorts of issues, and usually it's 14 bars of stuff about their point of view, and then Richard Burkhauser disagrees. Uh, so I think that this is a point of view presentation, and that's what you got. And it is controversial, but as you know, as you've just heard, uh, Steve and I uh, have very different views about what the facts are. And I th think it's great that we now have this kind of buzz so that all voices are heard. So I would say hallelujah. Thank you very much for put it, putting it in, into the context of Thank you, Rich. Um, as most of you know, um, one of the disability advocacy organizations composed a letter opposing the uh, NPR, an open letter opposing the NPR uh, analysis, and um, uh, they said that, um, that of course, there's facts and commentary inside the NPR analysis. As, as it relates to the facts, they said, we fear listeners could come away with an incorrect impression of the disability program, as opposed to an understanding of the program actually based on facts. Rebecca, what were some of the misstatements of facts in the NPR story? Gotta walk quickly with a minute. Um, I think actually what you were reading from was a, was a letter from eight commissioners. Correct. I actually don't think that was from a disability advocacy group. I think that was, that was an open letter to NPR that was signed by a bipartisan group of eight former commissioners of the Social Security Administration appointed by George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Reagan, um, and I think we actually may have one with us today. I think Joanne Barnhart may be here, and she was on that letter. Um, I, I think that that letter raised a lot of important concerns, and one of the concerns was one of perspective and the fact that I agree with you, Rich, that we need to have a rich discussion that airs all perspectives, and unfortunately, the NPR series didn't do that. So I think that was one of the issues that the commissioners uh, expressed in their letter with the series. Um, and I think some of the others were, um, were really that, for instance, saying that nobody on the program works. Well, actually, 17% of people who received disability benefits worked in 2007. The piece that's, imp well, it, they actually issued a correction to say that they had to change it after they aired it. That was, that was posted on their website. Um, I've been following it pretty closely. Um, so the, um, I think that was one of the mis this misimpressions as well. And I think it's significant to, um, to talk about, um, to, about facts, but we have to get the facts right. Another, I think, you know, significant thing that we maybe could talk about today that isn't just about the NPR series, but would add a little bit of depth to the discussion is we've talked a lot about internationally, kind of how are different disability programs run. Um, maybe we should compare ourselves to other programs in other countries in a different lens. Um, for instance, if you take a look at OECD rankings of generosity and of compensation of disability programs, guess where the United States ranks? We're next to last, right above Korea. And we've been there from 1990 and 2007, the two years where they've released that measure. The Netherlands is significantly ahead of us. Okay, so I think if we want to talk about how we can be more like Korea in terms of our nation's safety net and disability programs, we could have that conversation, but it's a relevant data point. So I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, letter that's signed by the uh, uh, various commissioners, but uh, I, in their use of facts, I want, you to, I want to read one sentence from them. Uh, importantly, the share of low-income children who receive SSI benefits has remained constant at less than 4%. Who, 
Well, it hasn't remained. It, it is true that it's been constantly below 4%, but it's increased from 1% to 4% since 1989. There is a growth in the program, and I don't care what these commissioners, what the ranks are, facts are facts. They just got their facts wrong. So there's, a, you know, a, many people get their facts wrong in these issues. Uh, but I think what I agree with, actually, what you're saying, we should be looking at other countries. We've just heard what some other countries are doing. Look at what the Dutch have done. Look at what the, the Swedes have done. Look at what the uh, Great Britain has done. They've all recognized there was too many people coming onto the rolls, and they've all used work-first methods to get us off the rolls. That's the story. What we have in SSI, for instance, is a, is a welfare program. Think about this. We have a welfare program in which the way you get welfare benefits is to get your kid labeled as disabled. That's crazy. Nobody wants to do that. If we have a poverty problem, let's do something about poverty. But why drag disability into it? Disability is a, is a safe haven, but it's a pretty poor one. My goodness. What I liked about this program is these people were just seeing that, hey, maybe there's some problems here. We ought to really think at the core of what the hell are we doing? Why do we have a system that you have to go through two years to prove you can't work at all before you get help working? That makes no sense. I think we could have told, told that story, and they, they didn't tell it as provocatively as I would tell it. My goodness. What is going on? Why do we accept the current situation as if that's right and do no harm? Dave, do no harm. We have a program that is doing harm right now. Let's change the program. Thank you, Rich. One more minute each. Uh, last question. Um, Rebecca, what do you think about the following um, stepping back from the content of NPR and the letter? Do you think it's appropriate for what highly placed individuals to assert to the producers of NPR that they shouldn't have aired something that they disagree with. Uh, um, the New York Times, the New York Post have differing views every day, so does MSNBC and Fox, but we don't usually write to the producers telling them not to air something. What's your thought on that? I'm going to take the privilege of my minute to say that I think you should ask the commissioners that because that's not in my place to answer. And I think people can express their views in any forum they want, and that's one of the things that's great about this country. Um, but that includes expressing opinions that disagree with something that's been aired. Um, what I think is, I'm actually going to agree with something that Richard said, which is that I think we need to be having a broader conversation, and that's one that's not about blaming the lifeboats for floods, and it's not about scapegoating programs and people and it's instead stepping back and looking at broader context and structural issues. And I think if that's part of what the NPR series was trying to do, instead of blaming the disability programs, which help a fraction of people who have severe disabilities and, and which are not a catch-all program because they have such a strict de definition of disability, um, let's have that broader conversation about how we can um, provide better supports in the workplace. I think we all want to have that, and Andy suggested that. But let's not blame the programs, and let's not say that they're doing bad things to people because unlike what was said this morning I'd have to with all um, respect disagree money is not a concept with these programs money is not a consolation prize for getting what you for not getting what you wanted out of life when it comes to our nation's social security system it's a vital lifeline for people for whom the alternative would be unthinkable Thank you. I think we need to think about what it is that our disability system should be doing. And what it should be doing is what you've just heard, work first. We need to consider a successful disability system as a system that puts people with disabilities back to work. I think the advocates have actually settled for pretty poor gruel. For God's sake, you've, you've given up the opportunity to get a real work program for the little bit of money you get on SSI. That's a terrible program, and SSI kids are trained from birth almost into how to get onto the SSI adults program. That's a terrible incentive program. They get all sorts of information on how to do that. They get no information on how to work. We've heard a little bit of discussion about how we're gonna change this system, but this is a tragedy. And they uh, uh, certainly talked about it in personification terms rather than in the factual terms, but it's in our book. No one listened to our book. Thank God for NPR to put a face on this kind of tragedy that we have right now that is 
moving kids with disabilities into the adult uh, SSI program. Do not stop. Just go right into the program. How many, what percentage, Dave, go immediately into the program? Two thirds. That is a tragedy. That's not a success. Well, I knew that would uh, liven us up at the very end. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Rich. We appreciate your willingness to take this on. From, uh, from uh, myself, representing the Secretary's Innovation Group, we hope to see you seven days from now. And speaking, for, uh, uh, speaking uh, as it relates to Brookings, uh, we're very pleased to have had this opportunity. And thank you, Ron, for your work uh, as moderator. I think you did an excellent job. Thanks again. We'll see you again in seven days, we hope. Bye-bye.